Just lay, lift your hands. Just let that come on you. The Holy Ghost is here. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence, Lord Jesus. We just receive you. Thank you, Lord. I've had the privilege of serving under Lendl for the last almost five years now, and it's been a wonderful thing. But when I first came to Revival, I wasn't where I am and who I am today. God had to do a little work in me like he has in everybody that has come along. I was cynical and religious and arrogant in my service for the Lord. And I used to set up in the balcony right up there in the first row because you don't have to dance when you're in the balcony. So I could be religious and my comfort zone was not interrupted. Until one day when I said, Jesus, I'm on the outside looking in on this thing. I've been here for three weeks and I can see that you're doing things in people. And I've had a taste, but I don't have the fullness. So he said, okay, you're ready now, aren't you? He'd been priming me all along and people had been ministering to me and I heard the testimony and I've seen the power of the word of the testimony in this revival like I've seen it nowhere else. It can pierce to, right to your heart and open you up in a way that not much else can. And I said, okay, Lord, this is it. I'm open. He said, all right, dance. Now, you got to understand that I was raised Pentecostal, Assembly of God, which is Pentecostal with a religious edge to it. <laughs> I was raised AG, so I can say that. My family is, is preachers to the bone, and I mean, I had done it and seen it, and I was not into dancing. I was a musician. I started playing the piano when I was four and a half, loved music. But dancing didn't have a place in the church, I felt. And anybody who I'd seen was kooky and wacky that could dance. But when the Spirit of the Lord... Moved upon my heart, I had to dance. You know, the interesting thing, though, was he wasn't just asking for a dance. Because we can dance a dance and not be dancing the dance. He said, I, he, and I knew it. I mean, he didn't have to say a word. I'm like, okay, you don't want just a dance. You want the David dance where I have let go of myself and my religion and my arrogance and my I know how this goes and I let the drums and the guitar and the keyboard and the singers lift me into the presence of the Lord and you see God doesn't say dance for me uh-uh he says, I want you to come and dance with me.
Está en mi corazón, yo danzo como David. Si el Espíritu de Dios está en mi corazón, yo danzo como David. Si el Espíritu de Dios está en mi corazón, yo danzo como David. Si el Espíritu de Dios está en mi corazón, yo danzo como David. Yo danzo, yo danzo. Yo danzo como David Oh, yo danzo, yo danzo Yo danzo como David Oh, yo danzo, yo danzo Yo danzo como David Oh, yo danzo, yo danzo Yo danzo como David Play it to the Lord How many Hispanics do we have in the house tonight? How many speak Spanish? I want you to sing this part with me. It says, Pónganse de pie a danzar. Pónganse de pie. Are you ready? Here we go. Pónganse de pie a danzar. Pónganse de pie. Pónganse de pie a danzar. Pónganse de pie. Pónganse de pie a danzar. Pónganse de pie. Pónganse de pie a danzar, pónganse de pie. Pónganse de pie a danzar, pónganse de pie. Pónganse de pie a danzar, pónganse de pie. I will dance, I will dance, will dance like David did. Oh, I will dance, I will dance, I will dance like David. Let God alone, 
has come before, this won't be the first time. A lot of you have been busy in a lot of good things. And you're saying, well, I'm not really stuck in the mire. I'm not really weighed down by heavy burdens. I, my eyes are on the Lord. But like Deborah, the Lord is saying, yeah, you've been doing the things that I've asked you to do. You've been doing the things that I've called you to do. And it seemed like a lot of stuff up to this point. But I want you now to let my will arise for you to take you out of the good things that you were you have been doing and bring you into your mantle covering so that now the work that you have been doing is going to be infused with power in the Holy Ghost and now you will ride above the mire my presence rides above the mire as God arises in me he is the horse
It's time for some of you to take hold of the horns of the altar. You said it's not for me, Lord. You'll pass me by once again. The Lord says it's time for you. I'm here for you. But you must take a hold of the horns of the altar. What is rightly yours, what I have called yours. And pull it under yourself and don't be afraid of disappointment. And don't be afraid that your hopes have been dashed before he's saying, come again to the horns of the altar. Come again to the horns of the altar. Some of you are afraid because you've had disappointment there before. But it's time, it's time, it's a season for reaping. So come again to the horns of the altar. The Lord says, come again to the horns of the altar.
more time. may be seated ladies we're kind of on a uh, time schedule here and and uh, I don't like to do that when it comes to worship with the Lord he comes first but we're just so honored to have sister Pickett with us and she's got to catch an airplane and uh, we've got to get her from here to the luncheon to speak to the minister's wives a few minutes and then to the airport so we've got a lot to do. Haven't you enjoyed having Sister Pickett with us? Let's just all stand and give her an applause. That's for you. That's for you. Amen. We love you, Sister Pickett. You've been a blessing to us. We get it. I need someone to bring and get her set up now. You've been such a blessing to us this week. And uh, just want you to know how much we love you. And Dottie's going to come and put the cap on everything for us. She says everything's so wonderful. And she knows her too. So she can just really bless you this morning. But you are a blessing to us. And you're always welcome at Brownsville. Always. And we've been endeared to her, haven't we? Those of you, how many haven't known her, never heard her before? Look at that. You've made new friends, Fuchsia. Well, this is just a God, a divine appointment that she's been here with us. But I gave her the song, uh, the words to the song I sang about uh, Rebecca. And she said, I, I want to just sing it this morning. So we're going to have to endure me one more time, but you're going to help me because we're going to have the words on the screen. And uh, Lisa, are you here? Uh, I need you back. <laughs> but uh, we do this in, in honor of you, and we're going to send you home with the tape of our voices on the tape and the words in your hand, and you can just play it and think of us and pray for Brownsville and all your precious lady friends that you've met here. Okay, everybody stand up, and uh, we need the words on the screen up. There we go. And you might have to hear me on the first verse, but it's about the same, okay? Twas a day in the early springtime by an ancient wayside well. Eliezer paused to rest his camel train. He chose a ride for Isaac ere the evening shadows fell. For his weary journey had not been in vain. So he took his fair Rebecca, decked in jewels rich and rare, back to Abraham and Isaac far away. the black 
blessed Holy Spirit from the Father God above has come down to earth to find a worthy bride. And our Isaac Goldrian has prepared his hand of love. And he wants his fair Rebecca by his side. We have left our kinfolks gladly. We bade this world goodbye. We're going to a land beyond the sky. Where we'll soon behold our rising in that blessed eternity. Oh, what a happy, happy wedding that will be. Oh, get ready, evening shadows fall. Don't you hear the liaison call? There's going to be a wedding, our joys will soon be here. In the evening when the camel train comes in, there's going to be a wedding, our joys will soon be here. In the evening when the camel train comes in. You may be seated. If you have your book, uh, I'm not going to read all of this, but I would like you to open up to page five in what is written concerning dear Fuchsia Pickett. Um, I esteem her so very highly. And I will just say that long before I met her personally, I would sit in meetings where you were teaching and often Iverna was with you, and many times I wouldn't want to leave. I, I sat there and I just felt pierced by the word of the Lord and would often just sit and say, my God, don't let me lose this deposit. And then we had the opportunity, some of us, to uh, go to um, Phoenix, to Scottsdale, and uh, Iverna had taken, Iverna Tompkins took a number of us under her wing, and that's where we had the privilege, some of us, to meet Dr. Fuchsia Pickett, and uh, had the privilege for a whole week to sit under teaching, and we would interact and share. And you know, the thing that I can just say is that the treasure is in earthen vessels, and we, we always know that, but we're so grateful when people receive that treasure. And then we were at a round table together, and I would just like to bring one point up that I was so impressed with and am so desirous that we all hear that. You know, many times women, when they are in ministry, always when we get together, they talk about the difficulty of women in ministry and some of the problems and some of the things that all take place. And not that some of that isn't true, but dear Sister Fuchsia, we asked you a question at the round table and we said, uh, what problems have you had? being accepted as a woman in ministry. And you looked at us and you said, uh, really, none. <laughs> and we said, none? <sighs> and if you look at page five and six, uh, a person's gift makes room for themselves. And uh, Dr. Pickett is an example to us of someone who has paid the price, but who has studied to show herself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And whether men, women, boys, or girls, the gift has been recognized and has been honored. And I believe that Sister Fuchsia is an example to us of what the Lord wants to do in all of our lives. She made a statement, you know, she's written seven books and I cannot encourage you more than to just read them because we are so privileged. But she made a statement concerning some of the people in her life 
that I thought reflect what she is to many of us. And she said, they made me desperately hungry years ago to be not a spectator, but a real participant in pure spiritual worship. And dear Sister Fuchsia Pickett, you are to us someone who has just provoked a hunger for us not to be spectators, but to be a participant. And as we welcome our, and I want you to read this, because I think you will realize that we too want to be women who have the gift of God released within us, even as Dr. Fuchsia Pickett was. And I was thinking, as you come to share with us, Proverbs says she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise in the gates. Our Proverbs 31 woman, Dr. Fuchsia Pickett. Let's welcome her and honor the gift and the person that she is. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for those, that introduction. But let me say something from the bottom of my heart. To him is all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. He did it in spite of me. When I said he could have me, he said, I'll do it with you. But it let me come and go with him. I'm just that little girl, that little young woman, the young mother, that little baby boy. And God walked into a room one night and called me by my name three times. I thought someone was in my home. Fisha. And the third time, I went to my knees. And he said, I want you to preach and teach my word. I said yes to him. And if there's victory in walking with God, and it is, it's one simple word, yes, Lord. Amen. Never do this to God. And never do this to the devil. That's simple, isn't it? You don't shake your head to God, no. There's one eternal yes in your spirit. All right, that's enough said for that, isn't it? I need to make an apology. We didn't mean to do it this way, but we found out yesterday afternoon that our resources were gone. We thought we brought enough books. We found out we didn't. It's almost impossible to ascertain the science of how many books to take. We don't like to ship back, but we didn't ship enough. So let me tell you where you can get them and how you can get them, any of the books. There are 13 that we've written, and the last one that's just come off is Worship Him. There's one in the making of Walking in the Glory. Walking in the glory, carrying the glory. But you may get any of our books by simply contacting Fisher Pickett. Com. I guess that's the way to say, where's my? Dot com. Don't forget the dot. <laughs> I did. Just FisherPickett.com. Or you may call an 800 number. The 800 number is 398 
0351-398-0351. Pick up your grocery bag, go shopping on the mall, and you'll find us, a listing of all our books, and Carol's book, the one I announced the other night, is on there too. And she wouldn't want me to forget to tell you that. All right. Thank you. Who told on me? I'm becoming known as a woman that wants a Coke while she preaches. <laughs> when I received the invitation to come to this conference, my information was that this was a Deborah conference. Well, I'd never been to a Deborah conference before. I didn't know you had them all over the country. I knew there was a Deborah, so I figured I must be speaking to a lot of Deborahs. Amen. So if I'm speaking to Deborah this morning, I'm going to speak about Deborah. Amen. If you're going to be a Deborah, let's be one. Amen. Amen. So if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, you're going to turn to the book of Judges, the fourth chapter. I do have a Bible here somewhere. Judges, the fourth chapter. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. They were used to doing that a lot, so they were in practice. But Ehud was dead, and the Lord said, sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Caesarea, who dwelt in Hersheth and the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for well, he had 900 chariots. The enemy had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, look out. You don't believe a woman can be a prophet? Just maybe better listen. And Deborah, a prophetess, how many agree with that? All right, just want to be sure. She judged Israel at that time. She dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and called Barak, the son of Abana, Abona, out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded thee, saying, Go and draw toward Tabor? and take with thee 10,000 men and the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Caesarea, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thy hand. Somebody ought to get blessed ahead of time. <laughs> I'll deliver him into your hand. And Barak said, If thou wilt go with me, then I'll go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I'll surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be thine own honor. For the Lord shall sell Caesarea into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. When I started in the ministry, when the Lord called me, there were no conventions. There wasn't even a woman's glow. Now, I'm not ancient, I'm just old enough. <laughs> there were no women's gatherings. And when I finally got invited, to the Ministerial Association, I was the only woman. And they didn't know what to do with me. 
They get up and say, brethren, we're delighted to have you here. Then they look around and say, and sister. <laughs> but when God called me, he let me know I didn't have to defend myself. Amen. If I have to defend what I say, then I'm wrong. If you defend yourself, then you're operating in self. The call of God doesn't need a defense. It needs the message. And my prayer was two things, and I've taught girls. All the time I've taught in college, and I've taught since way back. Two things. One thing is dress so that one looks satisfied. Not underdressed and not overdressed. I hope I still qualify. Until once they've seen you, you can get out of the way. Secondly, speak so that they don't know whether you're male or female. Let him speak through you. And preach the word so you get lost as an object to be viewed and let the Word be alive. And it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. If you don't have the Word, you'll be seen. If you have the Word, he'll be seen. Now, I'm not talking about that this morning. I want to talk about this woman called Deborah. The time has come. It has come. Sister Joy Dawson and I conferred notes together and we both have felt from the Lord that the hour has come when he's going to turn around and say, if you don't go, I'm not going without you. They didn't want us going with them to begin with, the men didn't. But now they know we're getting back to where we were when God made us. And I brought my own amens. I'll use them if I have to now. <laughs> the hour has come when the men are going to turn around and say to us, if you don't go, we won't go. But if you'll go with us, we'll go. And we'll bring back the spoil. And I have news for you. We're not going in to marry the ites. We're going in to capture the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amalekites, the Girgashites, and the Backbites. And this time, we're not going to bring just the spoil out. Every battle in the Old Testament up until this time they bring the spoil back. But the generation that God's going to take in the land, led by Joshua, the new generation, is not going to go in the battle and just bring back some goods. We're going after the enemy's head. And we're going to bring his head back and lay him in the lap of a woman, the church. We want to have the honor of taking the head and lay him in the lap of our bridegroom. Amen? Amen. Now that'll preach, so that's not the message. <laughs> but if you don't go, if, I, if you don't go, I won't go with you. It was wonderful when I found out how to read the word like the writer wrote it. When I found out he made them Adam, he called them Adam, That's right. That's right. and said to them what to do. Now the Bible said he made man. That word, original word in Genesis is not male. It's the word mankind. And that's actually, honestly, the Hebrew word. It doesn't start off by saying God made man. It says that in English. 
but the word is he made mankind. There was no male and female, they were both in one. They were in one, and we're going home in one. He made mankind. He did not make them naked. They became naked, but they were clothed in his glory. There was a brilliance and the glory that wrapped them. But the church has lost her clothes. And I know I have something I have wonderful to tell you. We're going to be able to come in his presence, not naked, but clothed in his glory. When they lost the glory, when they lost the brilliance of all the stones, they were once in Satan, and he lost them, and became jealous, and wanted them so badly that he's been trying to get it back ever since. But he's not gonna get it. We're going home clothed. In his righteousness, his holiness, his sanctification, not sanctification, but sanctification, we're going home clothed in his glory because he lost it and we've got it back. And the glory is the person of Jesus himself. Now when he made mankind, he said to them what he said. It wasn't until after, after the fall that they had to be separate. When they were in the garden, and Satan came, and by the way, he wasn't a snake to begin with. Now, I don't have time to prove it, I could just read it to you. He was a brilliant fallen cherub. Had he been a snake, she wouldn't have partaken of his food. But he was a brilliant, bright, I'm not talking about intellect, I'm talking about beautiful, fallen cherub, and when he came to Eve, he offered her what caused us to be in the shape we're in. But I'm trying to jump now because I'm conscious that's not, I haven't got to Deborah yet. I'm going to take you to where you're going to find Deborah in a few minutes. You with me? Yeah. All right. Now when the, they were in the garden, she was not at Eve. She wasn't called Eve to begin with. Her name was not Eve until after the fall. Her name was wife. He made Adam and his wife. Christ is not going to take an Eve. He's going to take a wife. She's going to be a bride. And, and, but before the, something happened, God said something to them and said something to her. In the book, there's a little word that used to be a lot of my vocabulary of my daddy. He said now, you're getting old enough to have company. Now that's too old for you to understand. That meant you're getting old enough to have some dates. But before I give you that permission, sit down, I want to talk to you. Now I'm going to tell you, Mommy and I have some rules. Mommy and I have some regulations. Now, we're going to put them on this side. If you follow these, we have no problem. If you follow these, you may date them Friday night, you may date Saturday night and Sunday afternoon, or Sunday night if he goes to church with you. And bedtime is 10 o'clock. Now that tells you about how old I am. <laughs> now they come in when they please. 
And if my daddy dropped his shoe in the other room five minutes to ten, I heard it. It was louder than a clock. It's bedtime. When the bedtime's ten o'clock. He said, now if you keep these, you may date, and you may have the privileges of being a young lady. But if you don't, then you don't date on Friday night. You don't date on Saturday night. You don't date on Sunday afternoon. You have to study. Well, guess what I did? I chose to keep the rules. <laughs> but he said, if you don't, because you don't, you'll have to pay the price. I read in the book where my father said, if you do this and this, then later on when she fell, he said, because. And we've walked all over that word and missed the whole lesson. Because, and this is the exact Hebrew, because of the turning of your heart from me to him, the fallen man will rule over the fallen woman. But the redeemed man won't try to dictate. Now you can shout, they're not here to hear it. Well, bless God, it's God's will that man boss woman. He's supposed to dictate to her. She's supposed to obey everything he says. Bosh. <laughs> now let me quickly proclaim a disclaimer. I am not a woman lib. I was liberated before they got here. I'm not trying to be a man, I don't want to be. I want to be a bride. I'm still a bride after 31 years. I heard my groom yesterday afternoon, and by the way, he sounded better yesterday afternoon than I've heard him in a long time. And I had a spell up in my room and it wasn't carnal. And just before I hung up, he said, I love you, and I like the way he emphasized it. <laughs> he said, I miss you, and I like that better. <laughs> then he said, I'll be glad to get home, and then I really did like that. <laughs> but him dictate to me what to do? Some of you know Leroy, you've seen him in conferences. He has no objections. He's not a speaker. He's a quiet man. They have to be to live with me, I guess. <laughs> but women's conferences didn't bother him as long as he got to sit on the front seat. <laughs> but they tell them, you're supposed to do what they say do. The husband that's been redeemed is not a dictator. Now, there are three or four ways that we've been made that. One's by the church law, one's by the law of the Old Testament, and one's by the law of unsaved men. But free from those, you're free from the curse. Because we're going back to where God created for us to be. Because he started out setting us in order putting us in the ministry, and the fallen man stepped up and said, it's God's will that you submit to me. You submit to him as long as he's really the head of the home, not the dictator. And that's another message. God called them Adam. And where did she come from? She came out of his side. Hang on, I'm about to drop something. <laughs> the first bride came out of Adam's side. The last bride's going back because of what came out of his side.
and efficacious vicarious substitutionary mediatorial work of Calvary where he bled his life out and opened up his side and brought us life. So the last Adam is going to get his bride back next to his heart. That's the reason we're reaching for his heart. We're engaged for a wedding. But the first Adam lost his wife. But the second one, the last one, is not going to lose his. He came after in person. But because the first one did not do what God said, they had to accept the rules. And the rules was, the unsaved man will rule over the woman. Come on. Fallen people love to dictate. Spiritual people lead. There's the vast difference. Deborah was a leader. I'm coming to Deborah in a moment. But I want you to know something. If you've both been redeemed, you're both in him. And he's the head of both of you. And we don't have to live today under the curse that because, because we've broken the rules. He helped us to correct the rules. And because of that, he said to her, this man will rule over you. And the church came along and they've written 10 lies. The church, the world, has written 10 lies that they've told the woman. They've told the world these 10 lies, but 10 is the number of redeemed church. And God has come to undo every one of them. And there's soon gonna be a book coming out that I had the pleasure of writing the forward for, The 10 Lies. The devil told the women. The church has told women. But Jesus is truth, and truth sets you free from that. We're not in the place of domination. We're placed close beside of our husband's heart. And if you don't believe that, why do you put it in the wedding ceremony? We've come to make them one. We've come today to join this man and woman together to make them one. Well, don't lie if you don't mean it. We're going to be made one. And our heart's not turned to the fallen man because we're not under the curse. Our heart is turned to God and his is too. And together we walk. Not being bossed over, but as one together under him. Do I say amen? Do I make sense? Yeah. I went through a whole week study in about a few minutes. You'll have to go pray over it to get an interpretation. I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'd like to give you some facts about this woman that God had picked up out of nowhere, it seemed. She was in captivity along with her people. And all the 20 years that she was in captivity, she was in preparation to deliver the people. And I want you to know something about her. She's the first of two people officially considered both a judge and a prophet. It didn't matter what the church calls you one or not. If you all one, you all one. And so God said she was a judge and a prophet. Unofficially, Two others, only two others, had ever operated as the prophet before, and that was Moses and Joshua. So shortly after Moses and Joshua, God raised up a Deborah. There was a tall lady over here on my left this morning that I, God has pointed you out to me three times, and God said to me, you have the mantle of a prophetess. Now, I don't have to tell you. God will tell you. You don't know it by what's happened. But God is still calling prophetess.
churches. And I'm shocked you when I say the next word, apostles. Do you believe it? Yes. Well, give me a better amen than that one. Yes. Okay. And she was the third judge that had ever ruled. And her people are in captivity. She's in captivity. She's not bossy. She's not trying to show herself. She's found a place to abide. Now, she, Rachel was the first one. Miriam was the second one. And Deborah was the third one. And she was used to deliver Israel in the longest deliverance period that the Jews had ever been in captivity. God put her over them in captivity for 20 years. That's a pretty good pastorate. That's long as most preachers stay. The longest was 40 years with Samson, but Deborah was ruler, judge, and prophetess for 20 years over God's people while they were in captivity. Now she didn't go up and berate herself. She didn't wear a tag to tell them that she was the prophetess. God let them know that she was, and she became the judge, the prophetess. And the Bible said the people came unto her. When I looked up that word came, it means they constantly. It wasn't they came one time. She was used constantly. They kept coming to her. And she had a word from God. She had rulership from God. She governed, led, taught God's people for 20 years while they were in captivity. Well, I've just celebrated my 50th. The word Deborah means B, B double E. It indicates a systematic instinct that understands orderly motion because they're quiet, but everywhere they go, they leave honey. Well, I don't have to teach that one, do I? All right. The word there really means she was that in government. She was that in discernment. She was that in precipitation. She was that in perception. She was what God wanted to rule, to judge, to speak for him to his people who were in captivity those 20 years. You don't think you have a place in God? Well, let me call you Deborah and see if you find out you are. Now, Deborah was a ruler. Deborah was a judge. Don't believe in women be judges. Well, she said in that statement of judgment, but she made her residence under a palm tree. That'll preach. Where do you live? She made her residence under a palm tree. Now that's the only tree ever used in the forest that she can use every part of it. Come on. Well, all right, you put, you put your interpretation. You use every part of a palm tree, even the seeds. And by the way, seeds will feed camels. <laughs> they use the seed of the palm tree to feed the camels. Come on. The camels are coming. And the bride has what it takes to feed them. Amen. All right. Now she ruled between two towns. This is interesting. Rama, let's call Rama in our time, and Bethel. Now the town between that means wells. There's a whole lot to that Deborah story. She dwelt among palm trees in a city that's called Wells. Not a spigot. Not a little branch. And it's not one well, it's wells. Out of your innermost being will run rivers. 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 And isn't it interesting that Jesus found the Samaritan woman coming to a well? Isn't it interesting? 
that the bride for Isaac was explained, declared, and told the servant where to find her. That's at a well. Well, I don't have time to preach on wells, but there's much more than one well here. There ought to be enough to make a flood. <laughs> now, the word rhema, rama it's called in the Hebrew, means elevated. God elevated her. You don't elevate yourself. If you have to wear a tag, don't wear it. If you have to tell somebody you're a prophetess, you aren't. Oh. If God doesn't speak for himself through you, then don't you bother to say what you are when you aren't. And that's not critical. You don't have to wear a name tag. I'm not talking about a conference tag. Now, don't misunderstand that. But you don't walk up and say, I'm a prophetess. <laughs> if what you say doesn't speak louder than your words, then hush. I'm prophetess so-and-so. Bye-bye. <laughs> she lived between Ramah and Bethel, and Bethel is the house of God. Now, we thought the house of God was buildings, and they are to a degree, but the house of God is not made of wood and stone. It's where you live. This is his temple. So she lived between the house of God, Ramah, elevated, wells, with seed to feed the camels. I like her, don't you? Now, the elevated house of God produces wells of judgment, produces prophetic visions, which produce together an ongoing deliverance for 20 years. She didn't have to have any other resource. It came from within. I hope you're listening. Am I, am I boring you? No. Okay. Now, let's talk about, her, as a rule, her enemy. Ehud had died. Once again, evil did Ehud, Israel did evil in the sight of God. When God brought deliverance through Deborah, the land rested. Peacemaker for 20 years. Deborah was not only a but she was a judge. A woman being a judge in God's house, don't you know they can't sit on the board? <laughs> oh, you haven't heard that? You missed it. They're not supposed to be in leadership. So says one of the lies. All right. <laughs> now, as a judge, her enemy was a man by the name of Jabin. And Jabin means, Jabin means intelligent, observant. He perceives, minds, uses the natural mind. Ruled from a town called Hazor, which means enclosure. The city's name he dwelt in means a fortress and a city. He had 900 chariots of iron, and he had cruelly oppressed the people for 20 years. But yet God took that woman and made her a judge over those people. Israel's condition at that time is she'd been sold as a marriage in captivity. Cruel oppression was going on. Yet she sat in open space, out under the tallest trees that God made. She didn't have to hide. She knew who she was. She knew what she was there for. And she knew how to conduct herself. You see, I wasn't called to be a man. I'm a lady. And God can't set this little lady in the place he wants her then I better step out. All right. Now, Esther's condition at that time was cruel, but she moved and sat on the tallest trees, 
holding government totally oblivious to the oppression. The oppression of the city she lived in didn't bother her. And the Israelites came to her continually. It means an action word, ascending process. There was an ascending process. You don't have to look for the ministry. If he's called you, he'll open the door. Amen? You don't, you don't have to go around and ask anybody to open the doors for you. I've never sent out a brochure announcement to tell people who I was to get a meeting. We'll send the bio after the meeting has been sealed. I've never had any man or any woman to go ahead of me. And since God called me, I preached in every state in the nation but one. I've been through there, but didn't stop and preach. Not nation, but state in our union. And I've been in many of the foreign countries. And I never one time wrote anybody for a meeting. And I don't just preach once in a while. I pastored 27 years. And God, through me in spite of me, has built two Bible colleges. We had a radio ministry, television ministry, sent out thousands of tapes. My husband ran the tape department, and he said sometime we sent as many as a thousand tapes in one week. But I didn't ask for any of that, and I didn't know I'd write a book. He did. But if I could take you back to the little town where I was born, and the little town that I lived in, and tell you there was a little girl named Fuchsia Turner, whose middle name, by the way, is Magdalene. I hated that word. When I was born, I wanted to tell this last night. When I was born, my daddy walked into my cradle, my mother told me this, and said to my mother, what are we gonna call her? And my mother said, Fuchsia. My daddy stopped and said, where'd you get that? <laughs> she said, my best friend is named Fuchsia. I'd like to name her after her. I was named after Dr. Kelly's daughter. My daddy stopped. He said, her name is Magdalene. We'll put both of them together and we'll call her Fuchsia Magdalene. My mother said, is that your old girlfriend's name? My papa said, no. She said, do you have a relative named Mag No. Why do you want to call her Magdalene? I don't know. I just know her name is supposed to be Magdalene. So, they brought with my birth certificate, Fuchsia Magdalene Turner. Was I was growing up in a little town called Eden, North Carolina, it was Leaksville then, there was a lady, a woman, who lived down below us, way down, who didn't have a good reputation. I think she must have been one that had the demons. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm saying, I'm not being that facetious. And my brother, who was one year older than I, found the key to tease me. And he called me Maggie. All right, Maggie. Every time he got mad at me, he'd use my middle name. So I wouldn't tell anybody what my name was. I picked up the tea, I've kept it ever since. Not because I'm ashamed, but that's the way I started out years ago, Fuchsia Tea, because it was a turner. And I signed my name, Fuchsia Turner. Fuchsia Turner, Fuchsia Turner Parish. My first husband lives in heaven, his last name is Parish. So Fuchsia Tea Parish, and that's Fuchsia Tea Pickett. I kept the same letters and the same number of letters I just moved him around a little bit. <clears throat> but I didn't even tell Leroy, the five years that we knew each other before we were married, what my middle name was. My church never knew my middle name. My first church never knew it. No one, I would let anybody call me Magdalene. One woman walked up when she found out, she said, it's the woman out of whom the Lord cast seven devils. That made me mad, I said, well, at least they're gone.
But I was in Jerusalem at the tomb when my father spoke to me. He said, what's your name? I said, Fisher Parish, Pickett, Fisher Pickett. He said, what's your name? I said, Fisher Turner Parish Pickett. He said, what is your name? I didn't have but one left. <laughs> I said, all right. You can know it. I won't tell anybody else. <laughs> Is Fuchsia Magdalene Turner Parish Pickett? About that time, he rolled back the clock and said, Your daddy stood at your cradle and said, Your name was Magdalene. He said, who's the one that washed my feet? Who's the one broke her alabaster box? Who's the one that was the first one to the tomb? Who's the one I used to tell the disciples that he's risen? Well, I was pastoring in Texas then, so Sunday morning when it was time to preach, I said, before I preach, I have an announcement. Many of you have wondered what my middle name was, but I've waited now to tell you. My name is Fuchsia Magdalene. <laughs> Called, prophesied over by my daddy, that my heavenly father had called me. And she's the only one that had the revelation now that doesn't mean I am, but God used her. And when she washed his feet, he says, she, you didn't wash my feet, that'll preach. You left my feet dirty while I walked on dirty, cursed earth. Those holy, clean, immaculate, emancipated, incarnate, divine, philanthropic feet had walked on the cursed earth. And his disciples didn't wash his feet. But the woman that people thought shouldn't did. She came in and bathed his feet, dried them with the hair, broke her alabaster box, and he said that that the disciples did not even want to accept. They didn't want him to die. They would let him talk about dying. They knew he was going to be the king in the country they lived in. And up until after the resurrection, the disciples didn't really believe he was going to be our redeemer. They thought he was our deliverer. They thought he was going to be the king. Let's read the first of who's going to sit on which side. Am I making sense? But there was only one person who got one fleeting glimpse with revelation of who he was. And that was for a moment. And that was Peter. And he said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But then this woman who broke in, brought a basin, washed his feet, washed off the dirt, left the immaculate, emancipated, incarnate, divine, philanthropic God with feet that's been bathed in an alabaster box. And he turned to his disciples and said, you didn't wash my feet. But she did. She's anointed me for my death, my burial, and my resurrection. That's the reason she was at the tomb. The others were not expecting to raise. He had already died. That's the reason they were scared. They had run. They were in the upper room, locked up and hid when they went to tell him that he's alive. Go tell. Go tell. Go tell. When you get a revelation, you can go tell. And you'll be there too. But Jesus said to them, you won't know until later. And later, the day after the resurrection, he had to say to them, put your hands on my side. And then he breathed on them 
when they found out who he was. I just wrapped up three sermons in one. All right. Now, they've been sold. They came to her. And the word there in the Hebrew is she had judicial verdicts. She had God's mind to give them the answers. Now, the next thing we notice about her, she was a prophetess. She's not only a judge. She's not only one of those God had said in the place of rulership. She was a prophetess. That means she was settled to dis given to settle the disputes. She was an inspired, anointed female. At this point, she was recognized by an anointed mouth. And when she spoke, she had something to say from somebody else. Her mouth was anointed. She went into rulership under, before she was delivered the nation. But Deborah found out what was going to happen. And she didn't go get her soapbox, run them down, tell people she was a prophetess. She waited till the moment that God had brought her to the kingdom for her. She heard they were going to be captured. She knew the people there. If they didn't hear God's message, would be destroyed. And she knew the enemy was coming. She knew the timing of God. And let me drop you something. I didn't plan to tell you this. But a few weeks ago, I talked to Brother, the pastor, the other night. Benny Hinn said it, on, I said it on his TV program a few days ago. He said, what is God saying to you? I said, three or four weeks ago, he spoke to me and said, I'm getting ready for an explosion. Come on, church. I'm getting ready for an explosion. And I heard that the pastor said that last week down here. I'm not surprised. Well, you know what an explosion does, don't you? It didn't bring in a few people, it brings everybody out of their house. I let out a war hoop last night when our speaker said something about Hagar. Have you noticed I did this at her? Well, I misbehave sometimes in the pulpit. Don't blame me. I can't help it. <laughs> a few days ago, the Lord said to me, the Arabs are coming in. The Arabs are coming in. And right after that, I heard the story that I hadn't heard, that Jesus has appeared personally to a number of the homes and the Arab people. There was the knock on the door. This has been written up now. It's substantial, some of you read it. And they go to the door, and they hear, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Dr. Shock, who's one of the greatest prophets I've ever known, told me about this the other night at the dinner table. He said, they don't see people. It's not another Arab speaking at all. It's Jesus. Who are you? I am the way, the truth, and the light. And said he went to door after door saying, I'm the way. Well, I said, Hagar's son's coming in. Why, why, why? Because he's Abraham's. What did God tell Hagar? That boy Ishmael is a child of Abraham's. I mean, God took the covenant with Abraham, you and your seed.
I told my administrator this morning, I said, one thing about it, when they get in, they won't have to be taught discipline. And they won't have to be taught commitment. And they won't be taught to pray. So look out, they'll pass us by. The same thing with the Chinese people. They read everything, then get their hands on. We sat with missionaries yesterday for dinner who they're translating my Holy Spirit book into Chinese. And they said, be careful what you put in their hands because they read everything they get their hands on and believe what they read. But we don't, we question it. Could God have said that? Well, you didn't read right. You're not hungry enough to hear him. And they said, let's get that book on the Holy Spirit translated quick and get it in their hands because he said they believe what they read. They said the translator that was translating my book on the Holy Spirit was not saved when she started. But she started translating, and there's two of those books, one and two, and said before she got through translating number one, she came over to the missionary's house, knocked on the door, and said, I've got to see you, I've got to see you. That Holy Ghost I'm writing about has already come. She said, he came, he came, he came. She was reading it. Shame on us. Obedience. Looks like he's getting them prepared for the fundamentals before he get them to him. They won't have to go to school long. They won't have to have 15 pastors to convince them that the book's a person. I said they won't have to have 15 pastors to finally tell them the book's a person. And that, that book can be taken off of those pages and written on the tablets of your heart and you'll say he's come. I'm sorry, but I'm bubbling inside. I'm not sorry I'm bubbling, but I'm hesitant because my will's about to explode. The wonderful thing about God's prophetess, she didn't go in and rebuke Barak. She didn't go in and put him down to exalt herself. She went and did what a lady would do. She went and did what a woman minister should do. She simply said, hath God not told you? She gave him the honor of having known first. She had wisdom, didn't she? Now that was my fun. But really her spirit was not that of domination. It was the spirit of revelation. She knew what was gonna happen. And God had said, if he'll go today, today. How I many know it's today? Come on. So she came down and went to Barry. And God had told her that they were going to be destroyed, that the enemy was going to destroy them, and that if he would take the chariots and go that day, he'd be able to save his people. And she went up to him, and she didn't say, you don't have the revelation, I can't give you the revelation. Hath God not told you? Ladies, let's be ladies. Has God not told you? God has told you that you'll go today. You can deliver the children of Israel out of the enemy's hand. She talked to him about the weapons, about the carriages, told him how I many the enemy. Go back and read it, it's interesting. She didn't rebuke him, she was a leader she knew how to lead from the right way. 
She said, if you'll go today, you'll find him. Now, she had been authorized to do that. She wasn't Snoopy. She'd been in the palm tree. She'd been a feeder on the Word of God. She had judged the people. She'd been a prophetess. She'd been a ruler. She was God's voice. She had learned to dwell under the palm tree. She learned to live among God's people and minister those to whom God had put under her watch care. So she was prepared. And when the hour came, God said, it's time. Now, I don't know how much you hear in what I'm saying, but if you don't remember anything else that I have to say, our time has come as women. Yeah. May God give us some Debras. Yeah. We've learned to dwell in the palm tree. We've learned to judge rightly. We've learned to live and be a well. You can speak when it comes time to speak. And that time has come. And when I saw the announcement that this was a Deborah's conference, I said, my God, thou has come. When I go to a place and there's thousands of women, and it used to be one or two or five or 10, if you had that many, it was wonderful. But all over the world, God is raising up the other part of Christ. The bride. And he's had some women in captivity by the law, by religion, domineering, wouldn't let us speak, didn't want us to prophesy, but we just kept dwelling. We didn't have to be bossy. We didn't have to act like a man. I'm not a man. I wasn't called to be a man. Dress like a man. Act like a man. I'm a lady. An anointed woman that God called. I didn't know that you could or couldn't preach. And I didn't know since nobody ever said I could or couldn't, I didn't go to a board and ask them if I could. I just did it. I did. I just did it. And somebody said, you have any problem? No, I haven't. Few people may not want to come to hear me, but that's their business. <laughs> but if I have to defend myself and tell somebody I am called, then something's wrong with me in answering my call. Because I wasn't called, I was called to be sent. And if you're sent, you've got something to say. Get into the palm tree, drink from the water, and become wells and you'll begin to hear that the enemy is on the way. Well, I have news for you, he's not gonna win. Because God's gonna take the new generation, the Joshua generation, is going in the land. And we're not going in to marry the ites. We're going in to get them. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amalekites, the Girgashites, the Bagpites, and all the rest of them and we're not going to marry them, we're going to conquer them, and we're going to come out of the battlefield with the head of the enemy and lay him in the church's lap. <laughs> One night he said, talk to me. About what? <laughs> I'd like to hear you talk. He said, talk to me about the children of Israel. All right. They were murmurs. They were complainers. They were fault finders. They murmured against all the 11 ways that you visited them to feed them. And I went on and finally stopped me. He says, is that all you know about them? In other words, don't you have anything good to say about anything in the wilderness? We don't say much about the wilderness, do we? 
We don't want to talk about the wealth, we won't complain about it. He said, look again. I said, they bleached their bones, they didn't get in the promised land. He said, look again. He said, there's another generation born in that wilderness. They did not murmur, did not complain. They ate quail on toast every morning. <laughs> they drank from the water. They didn't rebuke it. They drank from it. And he said, they were born in that generation. And he said, out of that generation that we talk about died in the wilderness, there's another generation and they're going in the land. Yeah. And he said, this time they won't murmur. I said, hold it. Don't forget Joshua went too. Yes, that's right. I'm not one of those young ones, I'm the one of the older ones. And you're gonna need some Joshua's to go, and I'll be Joshua's wife or whatever you wanna be, but I'm going with them. I've been listening to that Joshua generation. And how do you think I feel when I watch a TV program and see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people streaming down the aisles to the altars? When they go to the Washington Mall and Mall and stand up and pray against the demonic forces that's trying to take our kingdom. On the hillsides, of one of our countries, one of our states. I was preaching in a youth group, and they tell me there were several thousand young people there, 10, 11,000. They covered the whole hillsides of the royal part of Virginia. And I had spoken that morning on the Joshua generation, because I looked out there, and three-fourths of it was Joshua's generation. I was preaching to the Joshua generations going in the land. It was pouring down rain, not, not, not streaming, but it was raining. And that's the most beautiful bunch of garbage bags I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> they had got hold of these green leaf garbage bags and stepped in them, tied them up around their neck and put some over the head and said, Pray Jack! When I got through, they were standing on their feet yelling, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going. I said, the Joshua generation is going in the land. And they yelled, we're ready. We're going. Walked off the platform with my heart jumping within me and broken to think I'd witnessed what God had told me I'd see getting ready. And the master ceremony said to me, this, would you do me a favor? I said, well, he said, there's a reporter here, wants to see you. I said, oh no. I know what newspaper reporters do to preachers. <laughs> I said, do I have to? Say, I learned to mind. <laughs> I didn't say no, I said, do you want me to? Yes, I do. He said he's from the Washington Post. That's the second most liberal paper in the nation. I thought, oh dear. I wonder what kind of questions he's gonna ask me. So I went into his presses and I said, did you wish to see me, sir? <laughs> Dr. Pickett, have a seat. He said, I was in your congregation this morning. And he said, do you believe what you preached? Yes, I do. He said, you believe 
this is going to happen? After several questions, he looked at me. He said, they're going in, aren't they? And I said, sir, he said, what about, first thing he said was, what about all the dirt that's in the church? What he was wanting was bad reports on the Jimmies. I said, sir, I'm sorry. There may have been some dirt, but I said, this is not a dirty church. And I said, the dirt that you've seen is not gonna hinder the Joshua generation from going in. Finally, he said, you say? And you say, he said, say it again. I said, they're going after the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amalekites, the Girgashites, and the Bacchites. He stopped and he looked at me for a moment. I said, sir, I've got something to tell you. May I? He said, yes. I said, we're living in the greatest hour there's ever been. And I said, we're about to see an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, sky-blue, sin-killing, go to Washington revival. That's what I knew thing about Brownsville. I could have told him it's going on down Brownsville, but it hadn't started then. He said, say that again. I said, there's going to be an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, sky-blue, sin-killing, go to Washington revival. And we're not going out of here some night on the fire escape. And you reporters come around trying to find us and tell somebody you think the church left last night. I said, before we go here, the world's we leave here, the world's going to know we've been here. I said, in fact, before we leave, he's going to take the church to the Mount of, Mount of Transfiguration. He's going to pull back the flesh and show the glory of God, and all eyes will see it. I didn't know what I was saying. I said it prophetically. That's before people were talking about the glory very much. But God had told me he was going to take the church to the top of Mount Transfiguration and pull back the flesh and show the world the glory of God and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters will cover the sea, and I believe that. Yeah. This is about 10 years ago. I said, we're not going out of here tonight on the fire escape. You're going to see the church in its beauty. He put his pencil down and looked up at me and said, I'm a backslidden Methodist son. Minister's son. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, I'm a minister's son. Backslidden. And I said, go with us. I didn't see anything about the paper. I thought, well, they don't do good write-ups, you know, really good things. But the following weekend, I received a copy of the Washington Post. And the second page, not the back, the back of the first page, half of it was about that revival. And he said, she said something like this. There's going to be a revival. She told about it. He said, the only thing is, because he followed me around, I didn't know it. I stayed there that morning and ministered to young people and children, just walking around while I was waiting. And I didn't know he was following me. He was taking pictures. And there was a picture. Me praying for young people, praying for children. He said, she said, and began to say, she said, she said there's going to be an old-fashioned Washington Post. <laughs> Sky blue, sin killing, go to Washington Revival. 
He said that it was one thing she said I didn't understand. And I didn't know he heard me speaking in tongues anywhere. <laughs> he said it went something like this. And it took the English alphabet, honestly, and mixed it up and didn't hyphenate one word, wrote a whole line across the page. He didn't know how to write tongues, he didn't know how to spell or anything, he just wrote it. And somebody called me up and said, Pastor, I was pastoring him, can you interpret that? I said, never mind, you can't either, don't touch it. <laughs> so I've been going up and down the land saying we're going to have an old-fashioned heaven since sky blue sin killing, go to Washington Revival, and Joshua's generation's going in the land, and we're going with them, and we're going in after the Ites, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amalekites, the Girgashites, and the Backbite, and we're not coming out married to any of them. We're gonna bring the head of the enemy, get his head, and bring him back and lay him in the lap of the church. There's some Deborahs. God's raising up Deborahs, those who can prophesy, those who can preach. I'm not talking about some little ditty. I'm talking about who hear from God, who know what God's saying, and know how timely it is, and be able to move out with it, and in it, and through it, and help lead God's people into the land, and possess our inheritance, and tell the devil we're tired, we're coming after what he took, and we're gonna have it every bit back, and we're not gonna leave any of our children, or grandchildren, over there, for him to Just a few more words. You can get your pencil, you can have this outline, you can preach it. <laughs> I gave the rights. The reason God was able to use this Deborah, she had a mandate. She had an assigned task. She had been divinely predestined to fulfill that place. She had a mandate from God that gives you authority. You don't have to seek authority. You have a mandate. She had a message. If you don't have a message, don't go. It was a clear voice. It was a clear word. It was a clear command. She had a clear word. She had a clear voice that knew she'd heard from God. She had a clear command. It had directions in it. It said, this is the way. Go do it. She had clear promises. I put that under the second heading. Because God told her he'd draw the enemy to the river. You didn't catch that. I'll draw the enemy to the river. You just get to the river, and I'll bring him there. And she finally said to him, the Lord God of Israel has commanded you to do this. She not only had a message, she had a motive. She meant to set God's people free. Come on, ladies. God's freeing us. We're not jumping and dancing, get it, get it, get it, get it. No, God's just turning us loose. Because he said in the last days, and that reads the last of the last days, you pour out a spirit upon all flesh. And your sons 
and your daughters shall. That shall is subjunctive mood, condition, contrary to fact, nothing's going to stop it. They shall prophesy. They'll know what God said, be able to say it, and tell the world what God said. Hmm. I'm about to get blessed. She had a motive. She only had a message, she had a motive. And that was to go get the enemy and bring home the spoil. Come on, church, let's go get him. Now, she declared, now, it's time. It's time. Let's go get him. It's time for action. We're not sitting around whining because somebody didn't open the door for us. <laughs> we know who we are. We know whose we are. We know what our mandate is. We've got a message. And God's turning us loose. But your motivation is not to be seen if you are a deliverer. Go tell, Magdalene. Go tell. Go tell. Go tell. Now, like what she said, he has already delivered Caesarea into your hands. Judicially, you've got him. You just got to go get him. I don't think you caught it. He's already hooked by God. All you got to do is go get him. And the Lord threw the enemy into panic. He's going to get in panic, honey. The church is coming. Now listen to me as I come to a close. Women are being called. Not because they want to see you, but because we've learned where to dwell. We've learned to whom to listen. We have something to say. And when you've got something to say, Caesarea will turn around and say, I'll go, but I won't go without you. And men preachers whom the church has held down by their laws and regulations, women who've been set free from the domination of an ungodly husband. I'm not talking about insubordination. I'm talking about God's freedom. They are being prepared. And God's getting them ready. And God's raising up the barracks. But they're going to turn around and say, we didn't start this journey back in the garden without each other. And we're not going to wind up down here without each other. If you go, if you don't go, I'm not going with you. I'm not going. She said, I'll go. Why do you think you're here? Why do you think God brought you here? Did you just come to be with somebody? Or did you come to get your directions? Now don't go back wearing a tag. Saying, I'm a prophetess. Go back with instructions that you know where to live, where to sit, how to listen. Learn to move in the timing of God and know that we've been brought to the kingdom. Come on, we've been brought to the kingdom. Fifteen years ago, you couldn't have done what we're doing now. There weren't even any conventions like this. Now the men are turning around to us and saying, will you help us? <laughs> Modestly we'll say yes. <laughs> we 
but we've been out under the tree. We've been feeding on the palms. Of course, if you got Carol out there, I'd never get her away. She wants to take all these palms back to Tennessee and they won't live up there. <laughs> but out from under the palm tree, in what was called captivity of the law, when they hadn't read in the book where it said, when faith has come. Now, faith hasn't come, it's still in bondage. But when faith has come, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, Greek nor barbarian, male nor female. It's time for God to call the army. And it doesn't take women's lives to do it. We weren't raised to take a man's place. We were raised to be the other part of Adam. I said, it isn't going to be long till Adam's going back to his original condition with the bride on his side and there won't be a trace there's ever been a devil. God's tearing down the walls. He's tearing down tradition. I've seen God begin to change even the Isles of the Sea. I'm on that International Third World Board. And I've been going to the Bahamas and I'm part of the fellowship of the leaders of all the Third World together. I'm one of them. I have fun. <laughs> I'm one of the white women. And there's, I had over a hundred and some of the black men and other nations, other nationalities. I walk in the room, they say, here comes our mother. <laughs> and there's seven of them from seven of the Isles that really call me mother. Because I've had a chance to minister to them in their church. And Miles Monroe is my boy. I'd, he adopted me as his mother, and so I adopted him as my son. <laughs> and I went into one of their meetings, my husband and I, and which is against my principle, and I was a little bit late. And when I walked in, seven of the leaders stood up and came to the middle of the room and opened their arms like this, and I walked smack dab in the middle of them. Just got hugged by every last one of those men. And I liked it. And Turnell Nelson, the cutest humor, I'd have thought it'd come from anybody but from here. He whispered in my ear, what are you gonna say about all these black boys? <laughs> Seven of them stood up and called you mother. <laughs> I said, I'm not gonna say a word, don't you either. <laughs> Cause we're all coming in together. Let's go get the enemy. Let's go get his head. Let's take back what he stole from us. Even the sun sets free is free indeed. Even the sun is set free is free indeed. Come on, Deborah. 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 Let's go get the land. Let's go get the enemy. I'm going to ask our sisters uh, to come, and we want to speak a blessing over you. I was thinking, um, don't our hearts burn when the word of the Lord just comes into our spirit? And there has been a deposit that has been given to us these days. You have been blessed, and I would say on your behalf and our behalf, we receive the word from you, and in Jesus' name, the anointings will be released, the gifts 
will be released and the character of the Holy One of Israel shall be formed within us as daughters of Zion. The Debras are awakening. The Debras are awakening. The Debras are awakening. They are awakening and they are trustworthy and they are being proven to be faithful. And indeed the Baraks are coming and saying, we see now, we need to do this together. Oh, hallelujah. My sisters, let us lay hands upon this precious woman. We want to speak blessing upon both she and her dear husband, Leroy. We want you to reach out your right hand of blessing. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Diane, why don't you lead us? Oh, Father, we just come today to bless your servant. To bless you for the gift you've given to us. Lord, to bless our sister who has prepared her heart, her mind, her body, her spirit for so many years to deliver to us the treasures, Lord, that you've dumped into her spirit, delivered into her spirit from, from time to time and trial to trial and triumph to triumph. Oh God, I thank you for her and I thank you for her husband, Leroy, who has shared her and who has sustained and supported and strengthened and upguarded, undergirded her, oh, and loved her and missed her. Oh, Father, I thank you for them, and I bless them, Lord, with strength. I bless them with health. I bless them with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I bless them with the fullness. I bless them with every good thing that you have. And Lord, I bless them, Lord, with, with a peace that passes understanding and a knowledge, Lord, of your word like never before. And brand new revelation, Lord. Oh, God, she doesn't seek an importation from us, but she seeks a revelation from your Holy Spirit, oh God, that more and more, every morning, every day, oh Lord, there'll be a whole new revelation of yourself in her written upon her heart, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And I bless you in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the mothers in Israel. God, it doesn't make any difference what our age is. We need the mothers in Israel. And I thank you for my sister today who was deposited into us Oh God, such richness, such treasures. Lord, I ask that these words would be hidden in our hearts until they become the full harvest that these seeds she has planted are manifest. God, we want to bear your image to the nations. God, we want your glory to be seen. But Father, we know that the seeds have to be planted. There has to be the maturing before there is the revelation. And so Father, I ask you today, as you strengthen my sister in her ministry, God, as you pour more into her, as she's poured out to us, she's discovered Oh God, that as she pours out, then you pour in, and she pours out, and you pour in, and she pours out, and you pour in. And God, we're so grateful for what she's poured on us. And we look forward, oh God, to those things that are even forthcoming. Father, I ask divine health. Divine health, oh God. Divine health. Yes, resurrection life. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in her. And so God, we just ask you to quicken, quicken her mortal body, Lord. And Father, I thank you. I thank you this day. We realize that something has occurred in these few days. 
We've all been under a mandate. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We have all been under a divine assignment and appointment. And so, Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. God, we don't even profess to understand. Lord, we just know that when you deposit, it's there. Yes. And so, Father, we return to her, oh God. We return to her, our blessing, yes. as she has blessed us. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you for Fuchsia. Yes. Lord, I sit at her feet, yes. and I don't worship her. No. But I worship you, the God that's in her. Yes, Lord. Because she's become like you, Lord. Yes. And Lord, is it a great example for us? Yes, yes. And Lord, we pray that as she returns home, God. that you will just carry her. Yes. yes. Oh God, wherever her foots go, mm. I know, Lord, that you're leading in your pathways. And I ask that she has a good trip home. Yes. And that she has much joy and celebration yes. with her husband, yes. Lord. Yes. Give them a joy. And Lord, we just bless her as you've yes. refreshed yes. us. Yes. Refresh her too, Father. Yes. And Lord, when she goes home and puts her hand on him and speaks <laughs> blessings, Lord, yes. God, we just pray that your anointing, oh. your healing power will come. Yes. And Lord, that they will be the best days of their life yes, the that are ahead. Yes, yes, the yes. very best, Father. We ask it in your precious name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes. Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege, oh God, of sitting at the feet of your servants, Lord. And Father, as women who are coming up in ministry, we thank you, Lord, for those that have been willing to pave the path and to go before us, Lord. Father, we thank you for that which has been deposited into our lives through her, Sister Fuchsia's ministry, through her books, through her tapes, things that we don't even recognize yet, Lord, but that they, we will recognize in the coming days and months. And Lord, I agree with those that have already spoken health over her and over Leroy, oh God. Father, we ask that there would be financial provision to supply the vision that she has, Lord. Father, thank you for the way that you are taking her ministry into the other nations, Lord, through the books and things, oh God. And I just ask you that you continue to open doors that way and supply every need. We just love you, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for this servant. Father, thank you for the privilege to be at this woman's conference. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the desire of my heart and allowing me to see in my day, allowing me to meet personally Sister Pickett. Lord, I thank you for the privilege just to sit in her presence. Thank you for the word that she's imparted to us. Thank you for the privilege just of sitting and listening and gleaning precious truths, Lord, that you've imparted to her and to these other precious women. Lord, thank you for the privilege to have been here, and Lord, I pray your blessings on her. I thank you that she's willing to come, that she's willing to travel, that she's willing to, to minister to us that are hungry and that are growing in you and that are struggling still to be what you want us to be. Thank you, Lord, for these precious, precious women. Thank you just for the privilege to have been in their presence. And thank you, Lord, for what we have heard and what we have, have learned at this meeting, sitting at the feet of Sister Pickett. Lord, I, I praise you for her life. I praise you for how you brought her to this place. And it, it's just so good to hear about your mercy and your goodness of how that you filled her with the Holy Ghost and you healed her and how you're moving in her home and how you're supplying needs. Oh, Lord, you are faithful. It's so good to hear testimonies and to, to sit at the feet of wisdom of those that you have just blessed. Thank you, Father, for this privilege. I, I'll give you honor and yes. praise and glory yes. for this and I thank you Father for touching her, giving her a safe trip home, keeping your hand upon her and her husband in the name yes. of Jesus. Amen. 
Lord, I thank you for these last six years that we shared together. And I thank you that I see many more to come, God. I thank you, Father God, for the great deposit that has been released through this dear mother, Lord. I thank you for her graciousness. I thank you for her integrity, O oh Lord. I thank you, Father God, that you have provided everything she has ever needed. You have been her faithful friend, oh God. You have been, Lord God, everything, Jesus. You have been more, <laughs> more, Lord God, more, Lord God, and you have made her more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you this day because your grace is radiating through this vessel. I thank you today that we can see the amazing effects ah, of your amazing grace, Lord. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that the balm of Gilead is moving on her and pouring out on her even hey, now from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. I thank you that every bone, oh God, in her body, hallelujah, is girding up and standing up tall in Jesus name I declare the ointment of God ah, in your bone even down into your bone marrow in the name of Jesus I say speak living God even in the bone marrow I say live oh blood live in Jesus name and stand up I thank you for the eye, oh God, that you have given her. The eye that goes out, oh God, and pierces every element of darkness, oh God, that comes up her way. Every element of darkness that's in the way of your daughters and your people in the body of Christ, that you have given her a keen eye. And that keen eye, oh God, hallelujah, comes from the eye whose eyes. Your eyes that pierce, oh God, through the darkness. I thank you, Jesus, for the prophetic eye that has pierced through the darkness and unveiled, oh God, in this hour, what we have all been waiting to see. A body, a bride, standing tall and radiant. Hallelujah. Seeing herself through the eyes of her lover. Hallelujah. <laughs> And your grace is amazing. Your grace is amazing. Toils and 
Thus far, and it's that same grace that will lead your home. So we praise you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Get you some food. How about it? You're dismissed. God bless you. Hey.